I love Sundays. Sundays is the best day of the week. We were talking about that yesterday. Sunday is just different. Our schedules are different. What we do is just a little bit different. Sunday's the day that Jesus rose from the grave. Sunday is when Peter preached that powerful Acts 2 sermon. Sunday is when the disciples gathered. Sunday is when we remember. We remember all the things that make this so different. And so in my thinking of things, I wish every day was a Sunday. It's just things are so much better. I wish we could just go to work one day, and then every other day was just Sunday. It just make life so much easier for us. But uh, delighted to spend this Sunday with you today and spend some time together looking at some things from God's Word. This morning, I want to spend in our class time talking about parenting. And it's going to be maybe a little different twist to the subject of parenting. I want to talk to you about the seasons of parenting. And whether you're a young parent, you've got teenagers, your kids are out of the house, this lesson's going to be there for you. And there are some note cards in, in the back there, and there'll be some fill-ins to go along with this uh, lesson, just to kind of help you remember some things. But let's begin, first of all, in the book of Psalms 127, where there the psalmist says, Behold, children are a gift of the Lord, the fruit of the womb is a reward, like arrows in the hand of a warrior, so are the children of one's youth. How blessed is the man whose quiver is full of them. They will not be ashamed when they speak with their enemies in the gate. There are four things that come out of this right away we notice. And first of all, that children are a gift from the Lord. Uh, there are days when you'd like to give that gift back. I know, I've been there. But we need to see that this is a blessing from God. He refers to this as a reward. And then we see this idea of support and confidence we think about an ancient warrior and the way they did combat was hand-to-hand -hand combat. And so children were like arrows in his quiver. And, and they would give him support and they'd give him confidence in the help that he needed. And that children were viewed upon as a blessing, a blessing for him. Writer John Wilmore said this. He says, before I was married, I had three theories about raising children. I now have three children and I have no theories. And I think a lot of us can kind of relate to that. Uh, back home, we're in a little population explosion right now. That's why my wife's not here today. She, we have a baby shower back home, and she's it's part of that. And so she's going to be doing the baby shower and stuff. And, and, there, and there's just a lot of that going on. And it helps us to kind of remind ourselves how important the subject of parenting is. And back home in New Albany, where our church building is, in my office, I have this picture on a wall high up on the wall one of my kids gave me this and it doesn't look like much it's just a tree but what's interesting about this picture is as you walk around the different angle it changes it become a winter scene and it can become a fall scene and and I was thinking about all the kids we are having born back home one day and I was looking at this picture and it reminded me of the a valuable lesson of the seasons of parenting and that's what I want to share some time with you as we think about these things. It is important to see what God says about the family. God made the family. God shaped the family. God defined the family. And so God knows what he talks about when we look at what God says about them. We, we are reminded in the book of Ephesians in chapter 6, that just simple passage we hear so often. Fathers, do not provoke your children to anger, but bring them up in the discipline and instruction of the Lord. The valuable concept of that we shape the children's hearts. It's not the church, it's not the school, it's not the government. God is putting that into our hands and how important that is. Some time ago, I was asked to do a lecture about parenting. And this is how I began this. I am a dad. I have four grown children. All four are married and among them I have 11 grandchildren. My children are now parents. We've experienced a drama of sports from Little League to college volleyball. We've seen champions and we tasted the agony of defeat. We've experienced a drama of teaching the kids how to drive. We've seen honor rolls and missed scholarships. We've been in choirs and bands. We witnessed the ups and downs of dating and broken hearts and the frantic days of weddings. We've, been, we've had trips to the hospitals. We've had surgeries. There have been car accidents. I sat in the stands and watched them on the field or on the stage. 
I had the honor of baptizing all four of them. I conducted the funerals for their little pets that died. There were times when those little ones would put their tiny hands in my hands and we walked down the road together. They sat in my lap as I wrote many sermons. I am a dad. And every one of you that's a parent can understand because you have your own story. In the book of James, in chapter 5, James gives us this powerful lesson about farming. But this is where we're going to grab lots of our thoughts this morning. He says, therefore, be patient, brethren, until the coming of the Lord. The farmer waits for the precious produce of the soil, being patient about it until it gets its early and late rains. And, and from this there are four principles about seasons. And we're going to come back to this at the end of the lesson. But let's go through them right now, and then we'll come back and look at them once more. First of all, what happens in one season impacts the following season. We understand this in farming. We have a very wet spring. It delays the planting. We have a very dry summer. It hurts things. One season impacts the next season. That's true in farming. That's true in parenting. Second principle is each season has its own challenges and blessings. There are great things about every season. You know, I've got a friend who, who lives in Florida, one of my dearest friends. And he'll call me up in December and say, what's the weather like? I said, it's 200 below zero. He said, tell me about down there. He said, well, I mowed my grass. He said, all we do is go from light green to dark green. We know here we have the seasons. And we have favorite seasons. And every season has challenges and blessings. Number three, there is a growing time, and one cannot put that off for another season. This will be an imperative lesson we're going to talk about as we talk about parenting. The farmer who said, you know what, I'm going to take a trip overseas in spring, but I'll come back and I'll do my planting in the fall. Wrong. It won't work for him. So there's a certain seasons to do certain things. And then what we need to appreciate is those that do not recognize the different seasons, they suffer. And so when we come to parenting, this is how important it is that we understand and kind of understand the concepts that's found related to that. So we begin, first of all, with spring. Young parents, that little baby. That little baby comes to you in the world with nothing. He doesn't even have a name. He comes with no diapers, no money, no food. Here I am. And boy, does he change your world. It's amazing all the things young parents have to buy to kind of get all these things together. And that's the concept of a young, young family. In the book of Psalms, the psalmist tells us this, and this really is the goal we're shooting for in Psalms chapter 1, verses 1 through 3. How blessed is a man who does not walk in the counsel of the wicked, nor stand in the path of sinners, nor sit in the seat of scoffers. But his delight is in the law of the Lord, and his law he meditates day and night. He will be like a tree firmly planted by the streams of the water, which yields its fruit in its season, and its leaf does not wither, and whatever he does, he prospers. The goal is not to get the kids out of the house. The goal is not to get them a college degree. The goal is not to get them so they'll take care of you when you're old. The goal is to get them to be righteous people who are involved in the kingdom of God. That's the goal of all of us. I ran across this a while back. You know you're a mom. You know you're a mom when your feet stick to the kitchen floor and you don't care. You know you're a mom when popsicles become a food stable in your household. You know you're a mom when your favorite TV show is a cartoon. You know you're a mom if you've ever stuck a pacifier in your mouth just to clean it off. And I've got to confess, I have never, ever done that. That is just gross, but I have seen that. You know you're a mom if you counted the sprinkles on each kid's cupcake to make sure they are equal. You know you're a mom if you hire a babysitter to go out with your husband and you spend half the evening checking in on the kids. You know you're a mom if you tried at least once to put your husband in time out. You know you're a mom. Now, as we think about the spring season here, what you're doing is the home is where they first learn. They learn their name. They learn to speak. They learn the most important principles. This is where parenting is so important. This is where we see the essentials of what God wants us to do in this regard and how valuable that is. 
Now, now, now listen to me on this very carefully. Your child will grow up and your child will learn about God. He'll either learn the right way, the biblical way from you, or he'll learn from his friends that God allows you to do anything you want to do and there are no rules. Your child's going to learn about the Bible, either the correct way from you, or your child will learn from a college professor who'll tell you this is a, just a whole bunch of old ancient myths that someone's put together in a book. But your child will learn about the Bible one way or the other. And your child's going to learn about the church, either the correct biblical way through you or through one of their friends who think the church is just an avenue to have fun, food, and games. And your child's going to learn about love, either through you the proper way or through a boyfriend and a girlfriend who's just trying to get something off of them. You see, your child will learn, and it's up to us to teach the right lessons. In the home is where they're going to learn to share. In the home is where they're going to learn about money. In the home is where they're going to learn to practice forgiveness. In the home is where they're going to learn to be accountable and responsible and obedient. In the home is where they learn respect and authority. In the home is where we learn that every single person matters. Now, when we look at our culture today and we think how wacky our culture is, where is it coming from? A breakdown of the home. This responsibility has been kicked to someone else. So if your children see that you value character and excellence, they will learn that the quick and easy way is not always the best way. If they see that honesty is what matters, even if it hurts, they won't learn to lie is the best way to do things. If they see love and grace and forgiveness, they won't learn to deny their mistakes and run from them. If they see God in the home, they'll learn that his will matters the most. It's a sad passage here in the book of 1 Kings concerning one of David's sons. It says his father never crossed him at any time. I wish I could say that. My dad crossed me a few times, and I felt that. And it was the idea of discipline and the idea of responsibility and the idea of doing exactly as God wants us to do in all these things. And again, this is essential as we think about the home and how God wants the home to be as we walk with him and do all the things that God says. In the book of Deuteronomy, we, we're, again, we're familiar with this passage. But it says, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your might. These words which I'm commanding you today shall be on your heart. You shall teach them diligently to your sons, and you shall talk of them when you sit in your house, and when you walk by the way, when you lie down, when you rise up, when you bind them as a sign on the hand, and when they pass as frontals on their forehead, you shall write them on the doorposts of your house and on your gate. You're talking about God all the time. And it doesn't have to be set devotional hours, which is not bad, but you're in the store, and there's a lesson there. And you say, son, what do you think God would want you to do in this situation? You're walking over here, and you're having a conversation. It's time for bed, and we're talking about God. It's time to get up, and we're talking about God. And we have these cute little signs. You see them all over Hobby Lobby. There's little Bible verses on them. You put them on your wall. You put them on your refrigerator. And what you're doing is saying that God is in this house. God means something to us. And, and, and so how they behave in this building how they behave with other people, how they behave with adults. You're setting an example. You are the first Christian your child will ever see. And so in the spring is when we're really trying to instill all these thoughts in this. And so the emphasis in the spring is teaching. Teaching and teaching and teaching. And this is exactly where my four kids are. They're in the spring, they have little kids. And one of the things I hear from them all the time is, we are so tired. And I think, yes, you are. Yes, you are. I remember that. But that time will pass. But that's the spring. Spring then moves into summer. And in the summer, once again, we look at another season here. In the book of Luke, in chapter 2, as Jesus was growing up physically, it says, Jesus kept increasing in wisdom and stature and favor with God and with men. And again, the idea now we're into a different season. Now, if you did not plant well in spring, summer's going to be hard. You don't want to think about this. Sometimes in the spring, 
we kicked out off that responsibility because I'm in my career. I'm starting off. I'm a young man. I'm a young woman. And we're just beginning. And we're busy, 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 busy doing ourselves. But pretty soon we're into the summer. And if you haven't planted well in the spring, summer's going to be hard. And that's just the reality of these things. And so what happens in the spring shapes what kind of summer you have. And so in this time period, your children are now growing up. And in this time period, your children are now thinking for themselves. Now, you're not the only voice they hear. In the spring, you kind of got them sheltered. In the spring, you kind of control their lives. You are their little bubble. But now they're going to school. They're hearing, they're hearing friends. Now they're getting a little bit older. They're getting jobs, and they're hearing coworkers. And they're hearing people at church, and they're hearing neighbors. And so now they have all these voices, all these opinions. All these ideas. And the purpose of, of summer is to get them to reason within themselves. To think. Now, you're not going to be told. Now, back in spring, you just tell them, it's time for a bed. And they'll say, why? Because I said so. Now, over here, it's time for a bed. Why? Because you got to go to school tomorrow. And if you go to school tomorrow, all sleepy, you're going to flunk your test. You're reasoning with them. And you're getting them to think for themselves. And that's a valuable, valuable tool as you think about this transition. As they learn to drive, as they learn to start dating, they're starting to think for themselves. If you will, take your Bibles and turn with me to the book of Proverbs, if you will. Proverbs chapter 1. Let's just walk through a few of these verses here. I want you to notice Proverbs chapter 1. Proverbs chapter 1. And notice how the first major section of Proverbs is introduced to us. Proverbs 1 and verse 5 says, A wise man will hear and increase and acquire wise counsel, it says. And then as it continues on, notice chapter 2, verse 1 and 2. My son, if you receive my words and treasure my commandments within you, Make your ear attentive to wisdom, incline your heart to understanding. Here's a dad talking to his son. Son, listen to what I have to tell you. Turn your page, if you will. Chapter 3, verse 1. My son, do not forget my teaching, but let your heart keep my commandments. Look at chapter 4, verse 1. Again, just another reference to this. Hear, O sons, the instructions of a father. Over and over, what the first section of Proverbs is, is a father getting his son to reason. I want you to think. You're responsible. You're growing up. Words matter. Actions matter. This is what the summertime is all about. Jump all the way now to the last chapter, chapter 31. We remember this chapter mostly because of what is called the virtuous woman. And I think what we sometimes forget is the front side of this passage. Notice chapter 31, verse 1. Chapter 31, verse 1. Here it says, the words of King Lemuel, the oracle which his mother taught him. My son's going to be a king. And mama has something to tell you. And so notice verse 4. It is not for king, O Lemuel, it's not for kings to drink wine. Stay away from alcohol. It's not going to help you. You're going to be people, you're going to be leading the people of God. Stay away from that. Look what it says in verse 9. Open your mouth and judge righteously. Defend the rights of the afflicted and the needy. Think about the little guy. Think about the common guy. Verse 10 begins a section we call the virtuous woman. An excellent wife who can find. Mama is teaching her son about marriage. Mama's teaching her son about how to be a disciplined person. And so all of that re reminds us of this. And so it's during the summer that character and habits are built. Character and habits that will carry with us all of our life. A child learns very easy, very early to lie. I told somebody the other day, I wrote about this. I think we look at our own lies, probably one of the first sins we ever committed telling a lie. It's so easy to do. Did you clean your room? Yes. Did you do your homework? Yes. And you know you did. 
how easy it is to do that. But for some of us, that's the first step of a lifelong habit. Anytime I get into trouble, I default to a lie. The policeman pulls me over for driving too fast. I come up with a lie. The elders ask me something. I come up with a lie. Pretty soon I'm lying to myself. Pretty soon I'm lying to God. Where does that begin? That begins in the summer. That habit. That habit of lying. That habit of smoking. That habit of dishonesty. But same as, same as that is the other side. The habit of worshiping God. The habit of being faithful to God. The habit of reading the Bible every day. The habit of thinking about godly things, those all are developed this way. So if he's an athlete, he's going to honor God on the field. He's going to respect the coaches, play fair, and be a good winner or loser. You know, I've coached a lot of Little League. And the hardest thing about coaching Little League is not the kid on the field, it's the parent in the stands. I love the story of this little kid who was playing baseball, and his coach went up to him and said, now listen, Johnny, you know that when the umpire calls you out, you're out. Do you understand that? Yes. You don't holler at the umpire. You don't get angry. Do you understand that? And, the boy, yeah. and, and, and when the coach pulls you in to sit on the bench, you sit on the bench because I'm putting someone else in there. Do you understand that, Johnny? He shook his head yes. He said, and he went through several rules. He said, now, do you understand those things? And he shook his head yes. Will you go up there and tell that to your dad? And that's a problem, isn't it? And that's a problem today. And so it's during the summer here that so much of this is developed. Now, let's go to another passage, if you will. Go with me to the book of Genesis chapter 22. Genesis chapter 22 is the occasion when Abraham offers Isaac as a sacrifice. This is the test of his faith that God wanted him to do. And there are some great lessons in here for us. It begins in verse 3. Go back to verse 2, Genesis 22, verse 2. And, and God said, now take your son, your only son, whom you love, Isaac, and go to the land of Moriah and offer him there as a burnt offering on the one of the mountains, which I will tell you. Abraham rose early in the morning, saddled his donkey, took two of his young men with him, and Isaac his son, and he split the wood for the burnt offering and arose and went to the place God told him. On the third day, you ever really thought about that? You're an old man. Isaac's probably a teenager. So Isaac's probably stepping four steps or your ten steps. And he's in front of you. And you know what you're supposed to do. You probably haven't told him. Tomorrow, I've got to tie him up. Tomorrow, I've got to offer him. Now, there's something else I want you to notice here before we get to two or three points I want you to consider. But God told him to offer him as a, verse 22, excuse me, verse 2, as a burnt offering. Remember how Israel offered burnt offerings? They took a live animal and slid its throat. And while it's gasping for breath, it collected its blood. And then as it died, it tied it up, put it on the altar, and burned it. As horrid as it would be just to kill your own child, God's commanding him, I want you to slice his throat while he's alive. Gather his blood, tie him up, burn him. When you think about that, you think, wait a minute. <laughs> wait a minute. That's, that's really hard stuff to do. So verse 5, <clears throat> Abraham said to his young men, stay here with the donkey, and I and the lad will go over there, and we will worship and return to you. Stop there. There's a biblical principle here. It has nothing to do with parenting. We live in the culture today, and it's been said a lot within our fellowship that everything we do is fellowship. Or excuse me, everything we do is worship. Whatever you do, every day, worship is just 24-7. So when you're brushing your teeth, you worship God. When you drove your car, you worship God. Everything is worship to God. This verse says otherwise. What he's saying is, you servants stay here. Now this is not worship. Me and the boy, we're gonna, now this is not worship, but we're walking over here and we're going to worship, and then worship is going to end, and then we're going to walk back over here to where you are. Worship doesn't just happen. It's defined by God, it's planned, and it's determined. Not everything you do is worship. Let's read on verse 6. Abraham took the wood of the burnt offering and 
laid it on Isaac, his son. He took in his hand the fire and the knife, and the two of them walked on together. Now verse 7, key verse. Isaac spoke to Abraham, his father, and said, My father, he said, Here I am, my son. He said, Behold, the fire and the wood, where is the lamb for the burnt offering? How did he know we need a lamb? Why didn't he say, well, you know, I, I found some pretty white flowers here. Let's give that to God. This is pretty. Over here's a rock. Let's give God a... How did he know? He saw his father worship. Now, in our religious community today, a lot of people have what they call children's worship. All the kids are out of the assembly, and what they're all doing is they're eating and playing and having a good time. They don't learn what Isaac learned. We need to see the value of your children seeing you open that Bible, take that Lord's Supper, bow your head. They are seeing this is how we worship the God of heaven. Isaac saw that, and that's essential for us. Now, during the summer, what I hear parents saying all the time is, I simply don't have any time. How true that is. You're running to practice, you're running to games, you're running here, you're running there, and you're always on the run. Summer then leads into fall. Fall again is the next season that comes up. If you did not plant well in the summer, this could be very painful. In the book of Psalms, chapter 37, verse 25, I've been young, now I am old. The idea that things are growing, things are changing. And if you didn't plant well, this is going to affect you. Now the kids are grown up. They've moved out of the house. They've married. Many of them are in the spring of their own lives with little children. They have mortgages and car payments, and they're grown up now, and they're on their own. And this is one of the most difficult roles as parents because what happens is you change, become an advisor and a counselor. This is where many mistakes are made in the home today. We forget the season that we're in. I love the story of George W. Bush, the second George Bush that was president. He was at the White House. His mom and dad, his dad being George Bush, former president, were visiting one day. And as, they, as dad and son were talking about the state of the affairs of the country and the world and such things, young George has his feet on the coffee table. His mama, Barbara, come out and says, George, get your feet off that coffee table. Her husband, the former president, says, you can't talk to him that way. He's the president of the United States. She said, I am his mama. And sometimes we forget that. Now, here's what happens during the fall. You see, during the fall, our kids kind of grow. And in Matthew chapter 19 and verse 5, as Jesus was laying down some principles about marriage, he says, a man should leave his father and mother and cleave to his wife. The leaving of father and mother is not location, but responsibility. You're establishing an independent home, a separate home. And, and this is where we parents of my age struggle. Because there was a time when we laid out their little outfits. This is what you're going to wear today. Here's what you're going to eat today. Here's when you're going to go to bed today. Here's where we're going to go today. We're going to go to the park. We're going to do this. We controlled their lives. Now when we're in the fall, we can't do that. I can't call up one of my sons and say, now today I want you to wear the purple little shirt. He'll say, Dad, the home is waiting for you. I'm going to put you there today. I can't call up my son and say, now son, it's 10 o'clock, you better go to bed. He'll say, you better go to bed, old man. You see, because we can no longer control. All we can do is advise and counsel. Now, think about this. There is a difference from dumb and wrong. And as your kids are in the fall of this life, they're going to do a lot of things you would never do. They're going to think, do things you think, well, that is just dumb. I remember walking through a hardware store with one of my sons one time. We were just cutting through to go get something. He said, Dad, look, they make black toilets. I said, yeah, they do. And then we were cutting back through the appliance. Dad, they make black refrigerators. I said, they do, you know, I mean, I'm not shocked. I know this stuff. He said, you know, wouldn't it be cool to have everything in your house black, even paint your walls black? I said, that's called a cave. You want to live in a cave? Now, can you go to heaven that way? Yeah, you can. 
Would I ever do that? Never, ever. Okay? So, so as a parent, and you have kids in the fall, they may do things you're thinking, that is nuts. If they can go to heaven, they'll be quiet. Now, when they cross the line of right and wrong, that's when mom and dad have to speak up. We be the people of God. What you're doing, what you're thinking, what you're planning is not right. This is what the Bible says. But so oftentimes in this period of life, we have difficulties because we as parents are injecting too much of our opinion. Ooh, that picture on the wall, I hate that picture. Well, good, go home. It's not your house, you know? And that's what we have to understand, how they decorate, how they do things. As long as it's not wrong with God, they'll be quiet because we no longer control their life. And what we find out is they spend more time with their own children than they do us. That's that transition. And what we find out is sometimes the only time they call is if they need something. That sometimes happens. But it's in the fall where so much of this takes place. And you got to realize how valuable it is. Then we move into winter. And then in the winter season, again, we see some biblical principles here. In the book of 1 Timothy, in chapter 5, and in verse 4, it says, But if any widow has children or grandchildren, they must first learn to practice piety in regard to their own family and to make some return. See that? It's a circle now. And what we see in here is this circle comes about when we do what God wants us to do. If you didn't plant well in the spring, winter, it's going to be lonely. It's going to be lonely because you don't have a relationship with your children. It's going to be lonely because it's going to be hard. And what we find during the winter is when now the children, not the parent, the parent. This is a cycle that is part of life. It comes a time when they will have discussions among themselves about is it time to take away the keys because they no longer should drive. I have three siblings. My dad died two years ago. He was 95. He was driving in his 90s, and he shouldn't have been. And so the four of us came together at his house, and it was rare for all four of us to be there at one time. We were always in and out, but not all four of us. And he thought it was a little party that day. He thought, oh, this is so exciting. And... My older brother, Randy, is an attorney. And so we, we started talking about liability and responsibilities and laws. And we said, Dad, it's time to take away the keys. You can no longer drive. First thing he says, you know, I got a gun back there. I can shoot all four of you. And my brother said, well, you'll spend the rest of your life in jail. He says, I'm old. It won't be very long. And then he said, you know, I got money. I can go buy a brand new car. And I said, yes, and we take that one too. And that was a hard, hard discussion. But you realize when you come to the winter, those are some discussions you have to have. And we have to realize how important those things are. Again, in the book of Hebrews, the Hebrew writer talks about those who were before them. Remember those who said they spoke the word of God to you concerning the result of their conduct and imitate their faith. There seems to be a, a, a legacy of godly living. We should leave an example of walking with the Lord, faithfulness and service, examples of marriages that are strong and good, battles fought and won. Shame on us if we make things worse for the next generation. That's what our culture has done. Shame on us if we create more problems and hinder them. Shame on us if we give no thought to handing the baton to the next generation. And so... Through these lessons, through these principles, we learn how important it is that God wants us to walk with him through all of this. Psalmist would say in Psalm chapter 92, in verses 12 through 15, it says, the righteous man will flourish like a palm tree. He will grow like a cedar in Lebanon. Planted in the house of the Lord, they will flourish in the courts of our God. They will still yield fruit, fruit in old age. They shall be full of sap, very green, to declare that the Lord is upright, he is my rock, and there's no unrighteousness in him. As you age in life, there's certain things you no longer can do. I love the prayer that's always said, give the preacher ready recollection. Sometimes that recollector doesn't work very well for me anymore, and I understand that. But what you never do is you never retire from the kingdom. 
It is bothersome to me to hear people say, I gave 40 years to the company, now it's my time. Please show me that verse. It is never your time. It's God's time. And so whether you may not be laboring every day at a, at a factory or someplace you're working, there are still things you do in the kingdom. You cannot physically teach anymore. There's other things you can do, such as encourage. You can no longer stand behind the pulpit. There's other things that you can do. There's always valuable lessons. The book of Titus over and over talks about the older men and the older women and the example that they should have for one another. So when we go back to where we were just a moment ago, we put all this together about parenting. What happens in one season impacts what follows. Very true principle. Isn't it? Each season has its own challenges and blessings. Every time my kids got to a certain age, I would think, Lord, just stop it right here. I love the age they're in right now. And then we get to the next phase. I say, you know what, Lord? I like this phase better than that phase. And then we get to the next phase. And, and that's, that's just how it is. There is a growing time, and one cannot put that off. And again, emphasize it. I am busy. I've got things to do. But those kids are going to be growing. They're going to be going to another season, whether you're ready or not. And you need to see how important that is. And when you don't recognize the different seasons, there's going to be trouble. You need to realize you cannot wait until the fall to start teaching your kids God's lessons. You cannot wait till summer to do some of these. Some of these begin the day you come home from the hospital and start instilling and showing and teaching the things of God. And through all of this, God's word is needed in every season, and I believe God's word works in every season. Some of us did not get all this early on. Maybe we came in and our kids are already in summer or fall, so we're a little bit behind schedule, but we still need to see that God's word will work. Be the person that God wants you to be. Be the example God wants you to be and to instill these powerful, powerful lessons as we think about the next generation. I've been to so many congregations, and I look out among them, and I'm holding a meeting there. And a brethren will say, well, Brother Shouse, can you come back in four to five years? And I'm looking out there and I said, are you going to be here in four or five years? Or the youngest person in the building maybe is 80 years old. And you think, well, where are your kids? Where are your grandkids? Where are your great-grandkids? And we remember the lesson from the end of the book of Joshua to the beginning of the book of Judges. It says that all Joshua's generation served the Lord faithfully. And then as Judges begins, it says there arose another generation who did not know the Lord, and immediately what happens is the wheels come off. They start building idols, they start walking away from God, and God starts sending other nations to punish them. And so it, it's imperative to us that we spend our time teaching and teaching and teaching and showing and you'll get wearisome of those questions. That's how kids are. I'm a grandparent now. They ask me these questions 10,000 times. And I feel like we just answered that question yesterday. But here we are today. We'll answer it again. And you go over it and you go over it and you go over it because you know you're planting seeds. Someday, you hope those seeds will grow. That's thought for us. Well, that's everything I know. So I'm going to stop. And so... Uh, we hope it's been helpful for you. We hope it gives you some things to think about. Again, for those of us who have multi-generations in this congregation, what a blessing and honor that is. Those of us that don't, let's keep working. Let's keep praying. Let's keep doing what we can do, what God allows us to do. Thank you so much.